My pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Adler. Um, I had first heard her at a wellness symposium at Virginia Mason Medical Center that was for health professionals. And, and uh, uh, we all thought she was uh, very interesting, and so I thought she'd be, be um, an interesting speaker for you today. Um, she is a nutritionist with a Master's of Science in Clinical Nutrition and Counseling and co-founder of the International Eating Disorders Institute. She has been an adjunct uh, faculty member at Bachelor University since 2006, holds a graduate certificate in spirituality, health, and medicine from past year, and was trained at the School of Natural Cookery in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, she's the founder and owner of Passionate Nutrition, a Seattle-based nutrition practice that uses food, not supplements, as medicine, and she is the author of Passionate Nutrition, a guide to using food as medicine from a nutritionist who healed herself from the inside out. So we're delighted to have her. Please welcome to the Thank you so much. That was a, a kind introduction by Dr. Brown, and it was also wonderful that he invited me to be here today. Thank you. I'm glad we're talking about uh, nutrition today. Actually, before we even get started, I just want to say I love nutrition. I mean, hence my book, hence the name of my business, Passionate Nutrition. Food is powerful. Food has, I mean, if we think about it, our body is made up of the food that we're eating. I, I know that might sound strange, but if we think about, you know, think of our bones, think of our brain, think of, you know, our muscle. I mean, food is helping to make up what our body is made of. So therefore, it can have a really profound effect on how we feel. You know, how much energy do we have? What is our weight? You know, I mean, just everything across the board. And what I love about working with food is that we don't have to worry about the side effects in a way. Now, if you're eating something like polar bear liver, you have to be careful. <laughs> if you eat too much polar bear liver, you could die. But most of the time with food, you know, when you're making dietary changes, it can be really positive. And you don't have to worry about the side effects that we may worry with other things. Now, not to say that it's not a matter of being thoughtful, but I'm just saying it's a, it can be a very powerful and also less risky type of change, if that makes sense. You know, sometimes someone will come in, you know, I've been a nutritionist for uh, close to 15 years, and I remember especially at first, someone would come in and they'd have this whole list of conditions, and my first reaction would be to be terrified. Like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And then I remember, oh yes, I'm the nutritionist, I'm the food person. The doctor handles all the, all the side effects and this and that, I'm the food person. And food, you know, it's, you can make changes and not be, and it's not scary in the same way as it can be with other things. So, when we're talking about MS, I mean, one of the things that, that's already been mentioned, but just to reiterate, is there's no official diet for MS. You know, we may hear that there's, you know, different diets being, uh, you know, supported or that people are promoting, and there's no one-size-fits-all. And that's partly because there's no one-size-fits-all in this room. You know, every person is different. So therefore, as we talk about recommendations, as we talk about dietary changes, one of the things I want you to keep in your mind is that ultimately, you are going to be the best judge of how it is affecting you. You know, you can work with your doctor and look at your labs, you can look at how you feel, you know, but you know your body best. So if you're feeling better with what you're doing, that's a great sign. Even though it may not be the diet that works best for the person next to you or the person across the room, really trust that bodily wisdom that you have uh, with what is working and what isn't. And the nice thing about dietary changes is that it's also, these are very possible to help minimize a lot of the symptoms that we see, uh, like fatigue, constipation, you know, weight has been talked a lot about today. Dietary changes can help all of these things. Okay, we talked about uh, that we're all unique. And we talked about that food's powerful. I had to jump ahead to that one because that's one of the things I, I really believe in and wanted to uh, preface our talk today with. So one of the things that I'd like to discuss is this idea of having whole foods in our diet. So do I mean the big, fancy, expensive grocery store? 
Not so much. Right. What do I mean by whole foods? Real. Real. The whole thing. Exactly. Right. So there's ways that you can find out if something is a whole food. One, can I imagine it growing? Okay, so we can imagine an apple tree. We can imagine, you know, spinach growing in a garden. We can imagine a chicken laying an egg. Cheeseburger tree, can we imagine a cheeseburger tree? Well, actually, though, that gets a little bit tricky. We can't, I mean, sure, if we have a good imagination, we can envision a cheeseburger tree. If we break down the ingredients in a cheeseburger, so can we envision a cow? Yes. In grass. Okay, we can envision that. Can we? I mean, if we break down the components, that one gets a little bit tricky. You know, however, what about, can we, do we ever see a Doritos bush? <laughs> not, not so much. <laughs> right. So when we're thinking about what to eat, because it gets so confusing. I mean, one of the things with nutrition is that we find over and over again, we're overwhelmed with information in a way. You know, um, we read this book, we read that book, we go to this talk, we go to that talk, we, you know, research on the internet, we talk to a lot of different people, and there's a lot of very conflicting views, right? I mean, how many of you have experienced that? Yeah, I mean, it can be overwhelming. So what tends to happen, especially one of the things I've seen a lot with clients, is they're incredibly educated about nutrition, so much so that they come in and they say, everything conflicts each other, so I don't know what to do, so I'm just eating cereal. <laughs> because we can get debilitated almost by too much knowledge in a way. You know, by too many conflicting uh, nutrition ideas. So what I like to do is, especially with a, a talk for the general public versus individualized nutrition, is to try to create parameters that keep it simple in a way. So if we stick to this premise of eating whole foods, this accomplishes a lot of our goals. You know, this accomplishes a lot of what was discussed in, in the last presentation, you know, about cutting down on processed foods. And this also, what I like about it, is it moves away from a lot of that confusion. You know, because right now, uh, there might be certain dietary advice. Like right now, gluten is this evil thing. Mm -hmm. Well, next year at this time, it might be apples. Apples are, you know, something to avoid at all costs. I mean, it changes all the time. So if we stick to these ideas of, can I imagine it growing? How many ingredients does it have? So if it's all food, it'll have one. And other ways to think about it is, would my grandmother have eaten this? You know, would my great-grandmother have eaten it? There's some exceptions. But in general, our food supply has changed the most dramatically in the last 60 or so years. That's when we've really seen a big shift happen. So if we think about what have people been eating throughout time, that typically sets us up for success. Now, going back to that idea of the cheeseburger, so or let's use chili as an example. So we're not going to find chili isn't a whole food in and of itself. However, Okay, so if, if you had if you made chili at home, what would be in there? Onions. Okay, onions. Can we visualize onions for right? Yeah. Right. Tomatoes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Beef. Beef. Yeah. Beans. Yeah. Beef, right? Yes, yeah, probably some spices. So if we break it down, each thing in there would be a whole food, so therefore, yay, chili. You know, it fits the criteria. Now what if we're looking at a can and it says you know, beans, tomatoes, beef, spices, sure. monohexophosphate number seven. <laughs> Not so much, right? Okay, so those are the types of things. Because also, one of the things with MS is that there can be limited mobility, there can limit, be limited energy to cook. So I'm not saying that we have to cook everything from scratch. But even when we're looking at the store, you know, start to read ingredients. You know, start to look and see, okay, can I recognize everything in this label? Would my grandmother have had each ingredient on this label in her cupboard or in her refrigerator? If so, that's, that's typically a good sign. Okay. So not so much the big marshmallow. More like, you know, you have the beautiful fruit tray over here that was provided. 
And part of the reason, I mean, one of the reasons that we want to try to avoid the processed foods is that they're just, they're just missing pieces that are important. Just in general, we want to increase our vitality. You know, we want to increase our overall health. And those foods, you know, think of how much vitality that they have. You know, they've been pretty processed. They've gone through a lot. The vitality is a lot lower. And then there's a lot of nutrition things that happens that way too. It, this isn't across the board. There are exceptions. However, you know, if we go for the outside of the grocery store, probably a lot of you have heard that, you know, shop the perimeter of the grocery store. In general, that's a great idea because that's going to keep you more in the whole food section versus where we get into the more processed section. Now, not to say going in to get those fire roasted tomatoes. I love fire roasted tomatoes. You know, things like that, that's going to be in the inner aisles. But in general, you want it to be where the inner aisles are more of an exception versus where you're spending the bulk of your time at the grocery store. We already mentioned this a bit, but just a lot of nutrients get lost when foods get processed. And this is a, a little bit of a, a joke. I don't know if you can read it, but it's, it's essentially where there's two women that are reading the labels of uh, packaged goods, and it says, ve vegetable monoglyceride, sodium phosphate, sorbitan monosterate, sodium sulfate. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And they say, excuse me, sir, what aisle do you keep the food? <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like more and more our food supply has gone in this direction. You know, and there's a lot of reasons behind this. Shelf life, cost, I mean, a number of things that we don't need to get into. But ultimately, the more we look for whole foods where we can read the ingredients, the better off we're going to be. And again, this doesn't mean cooking from scratch every day. That's not practical for most people, and especially when you're, you have fatigue. You know, especially when you have mobility issues. That's not what I'm referring to, but even, you know, looking for more whole foods products. Now, I also know that there's a, a, a cost issue that can come in. And so it requires being a savvy shopper in a lot of ways. Now, there, there are places where you can go where you can get foods that uh, are whole foods still, and they still cost less. Where? Where? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you for myself, and, and I have no, I have no endorsements from this place, but but I'll tell you since you asked. I love to go to grocery outlet first. I go to grocery outlet first, <laughs> and I check. I mean, it's it's one of those places you go in and you pass by eighty percent of the stuff, but then you find these gems, and it's like yay! And then I stock up and buy a bunch of whatever it is. But you'll find in your neighborhoods too, you know, places that you can go to buy particular things that do reduce the cost. Because it does, unfortunately, the way our system is set up right now, it does take more money a lot of times to eat more whole foods if we're having them in a more processed form. Like meaning where we buy the chili that's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Now if we're making it from scratch, if we're getting, you know, legumes from the bulk bin, you can cut down the cost, but it requires more cooking. And that may not be feasible with where your particular situation is. Okay, so whole foods. And we, we've gone over this in a way, but just thinking about what have people eaten throughout history. Now, another thing that can be really helpful that can sometimes be overlooked is getting enough essential fatty acids in our diet. Now, why do you think it might be called essential fatty acids? We need them. Exactly, because we need them. They're essential for our body. And it's something that our body cannot produce. You know, it has to come from our diet. So essential fatty acids can be really helpful. Like what was talked about previously was helping to reduce inflammation. You know, I heard that in, in both talks related to cardiovascular risk. Well, a great way to help reduce inflammation, you know, is to get more essential fatty acids in our diet. And essential fatty acids do a number of things, but where do we get these from? You know, what do you think of automatically? Avocados. Fish. Fish, right. And what kind of fish? Cold water. Right, cold water fish. Exactly. And I'll explain. I, I taught food science for many years, and at least for me, it helps things stick in my brain if I understand why sometimes uh, certain types of foods help in the way that they do. Okay, so imagine, you know, if we had a, a fish 
that was made up of saturated fat, and then it was in cold water, what would happen to it? It would get stiff, right? So it would be fish food pretty quickly for other fish, right? But these essential fatty acids stay fluid even in cold temperatures, so those fish are able to move. You know, think of inside our bodies, you know, being more fluid, being able to, you know, decrease inflammation. So therefore, that's why it's cold water fish. Now, salmon is what, I mean, we live in salmon country, so that's what we tend to think of. But salmon is also very pricey. You know, I know in my house it's a once in a while. I mean, it's, it's more of a special occasion thing, you know, especially when you've got a, a family. But there's other ways to get these essential fatty acids that can save money as well. So what about sardines? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. I, I see positive responses. Sometimes I say sardines. No, no. <laughs> so sardines are much more affordable and they're also really high in these essential fatty acids. And in fact, I mean, sardines have been used throughout history. That's something that our grandmother or great grandmother may have had quite a bit of. Actually, I think this is interesting. So school children used to be rewarded with sardines if they got the answer correct to a, a test question if we go back in time. Now, that wouldn't necessarily happen now. I mean, we're competing with Cheetos, but you know, if we go back far enough. Now, not everybody likes fish. So that's something that I, I hear from a lot of people. There's other ways to get these essential fatty acids. So another source that might be surprising is grass-fed meat. Now, why grass-fed meat? Plant-based. Plant-based. Right. The vegetable fed has omega-6. When cows are eating grass, so just like what we eat makes up our body, what other animals eat and makes up their body. So there's a big difference. You know, a lot of research that's done on meat, for example, is done on, on feedlot meat. So that's going to be, you know, corn, soy, you know. It, it changes the profile of that meat. However, if you have something that's grass-fed, actually the essential fatty acid content, you're starting to get up there with salmon. You know, it changes the meat. And in fact, the overall fat content is more like boneless, skinless chicken breast. You know, so it's a really, it's a lean, it's a much leaner type of meat. So that's why it's sometimes when people have grass-fed meat, they say, oh, this is kind of gamey, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's, it takes a, a different type of cooking. You know, you cook it at a lower temperature. Uh, now, it can be more expensive. So what are ways that we can have grass-fed meat, if that's, you know, one of the ways we want to do it, that can cut the cost? Fire, Buy a cow. You can buy, well, you can buy a cow, right? I mean, there's people that divide it up and it saves money. Also, thinking about uh, stewing, you know, roasts. I mean, again, steaks, things like that, it, they're cost prohibitive, especially if you're thinking of grass fed. So, thinking of uh, less expensive cuts that typically take longer periods of time to cook. So, this is where things like a crock pot. Can come in. Now naturally grass-fed meat costs more, so what does this mean is going to happen? We eat less, right? So we eat more probably in the balance that is more recommended. You know, that's that's what happens. Yes? Um, what about something like elk? Like yes, so the question is what about something like elk? Elk is a, is a great choice. So anytime you think about animals that are eating pasture or wild, think about just like what we were talking about for us, what have those animals been eating throughout history? Right, cows have been eating grass and pasture throughout history, elk, right, so wild game, that's that's a great choice. I guess I should stay put, I think that's, I'm causing a lot of feedback, that's hard for me. Okay, and so then, Talking about having the fish, you know, talking about essential fatty acids and some of the sources of places we can get those, it starts to segue into this idea of getting more protein. Now, it all depends on where we live. You know, there's parts of the U.S. where it's holy protein. <laughs> you know, I lived in Nebraska for many years. I think I would starve as a nutritionist. You know, and it's, it's a place where there was no shortage of protein. I mean, I'm stereotyping, you know, there's, there's exceptions to this. 
However, in the Pacific Northwest, in general, again, I'm doing big sweeping generalizations, we tend to have a more educated population around nutrition, and so therefore we tend to think that most Americans overconsume protein, so then we tend to go the opposite end of the spectrum, or at least that's what we find a lot with clients. And what happens is, if we're not getting enough protein, then protein is a building block for energy. You know, we, we need energy, and especially with MS, there's already fatigue. So if we're not getting enough protein, we don't have the building blocks to heal and repair in the same way. We don't have the building blocks for energy. And a great way to know if, as a generalization, if you're getting enough protein or not is, do you crave sugar? Yeah, and a lot of people, I know a lot of clients, you know, uh, not just within us, but clients across the board, can come in, you know, sit down, and there's, it's not uncommon to have someone start crying right away and say, I feel like an addict, you know, but instead of drugs, it's sugar, right? I can't control sugar. Well, if we're not getting enough protein, it's not like, mm, maybe. Most, for most people, if they're not getting enough protein, they really crave sugar. So, now there's exceptions to this. Again, I'm making, you know, generalizations. It's going to be individual. But the great thing about this is you can, you can try it and see. You can listen to your body. So, a few days of getting adequate protein, notice what your energy is. Notice what your sugar cravings are. Protein is one of the few times as a nutritionist that uh, I think we can feel like a rock star. Because most of the time with nutrition, it's slow and steady over time. It's not like we start eating broccoli and the next day we jump higher. You know, that doesn't happen. It's slow changes over time that start to add up. But if somebody hasn't been getting enough protein and then they start to, that's when it can be a pretty marked difference in terms of energy level and sugar cravings. That's what we, we see a lot. Yes? It can. And there's other factors that can tie in, but sugar cravings uh, and protein really are, I mean, to put it in perspective, in my book there's a whole chapter, like, of that protein-sugar connection and how big it is. But there can be other things. The other thing about protein is that protein helps create the building blocks, you know, for those neurotransmitters that help affect how we feel. So there was a, a mention earlier about how, you know, psychiatry is embracing nutrition a lot more. And I know that we've definitely seen that with a lot of our referrals. And one of the big things, uh, actually I'm thinking of a few psychiatrists that refer, refer to us and they think, oh, all they do is protein. And it, it, not so much, it depends on what someone comes in for. But when we're dealing with maybe anxiety, depression, and we're looking at dietary changes, a big thing that can make a difference is if we are getting enough protein. And partly because, again, those are the building blocks for neurotransmitters for our brain. And it also helps regulate our blood sugar levels. You know, if we're eating protein regularly throughout the day, helps with energy. I mean, there's a whole ripple effect from this. So let's just go through an example. And again, this is without any conditions or other issues going on. This is just, say we have a 150 pound woman, and I, this is the only time that I get into numbers with nutrition, for the most part. And that's mostly because I get frustrated with the nutrition world in a way. I feel like we can get too rigid, we get too numbers oriented, where I think there's a lot of individuality in there too. But I bring it up with protein because I think sometimes it can be eye-opening actually how much we need in a day. And so if this is a 150 pound woman, so she's gonna need around 60 grams of protein a day. And if you look at the breakdown of what that looks like, I mean, what, what's your initial reaction? Wow. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's, that's For some fun. people it might not feel like very much, and so that's a sign that you know, you're probably focusing more on protein. And I heard a couple of voices over here that said, wow, you know, that's a lot, and that's a, that would be harder to get. So that's the thing, it's really different for everyone. You know, because we're all starting at a different place within our diet. So again, you know, I would recommend just try it for yourself. 
Mm -hmm. See if you notice a difference. Yes. The protein during to do those work well? Is that protein? That is a, I'm so glad you asked this question. Okay, so the question was about protein drinks. And people like protein powders, protein bars, protein drinks. Partly they're convenient, you know, they taste good. But let's go back to that question. Would our grandmother or our great grandmother have eaten those? No. Can you recognize all the ingredients on the label? No. Sometimes. There are some bars that you can't, it's true. However, in general, this is where we start to get into more processed foods. So, my recommendation, you know, because I'm the goal of this, uh, if there was one big takeaway for you today, I would hope that it would be about whole foods, choosing whole foods. And protein bars or shakes or drinks don't fit into that category. Now, I can say more anecdotally from working with clients over the years, when somebody is getting enough enough protein, but from bars and powders, I don't see the same impact in terms of how they feel, their energy, their cravings, that I do when it's a whole food product. So personally, I would much rather that somebody focus on whole foods. Okay. Even though I know that that can get convenient. That fits in the blender? I'm sorry? That fits in the blender? It fits in the blender? Whole foods that, well, you can. Actually, you can make more whole, make it into a smoothie or a shake. But with whole foods ingredients, that's, that it is making up what you put in the blender. Definitely. Actually, I, uh, I believe it was in this room, I gave a talk one time on uh, dysphagia. And we talked a lot about how to do that with whole foods. That was many years ago, but I, I was thinking it was this room. Okay, so another thing to think about, see, with nutrition, a lot of times, kind of the simple things get overlooked. Like, how many of us know we need to drink water? And probably everyone in this room, you know, how many know that we, we probably don't get enough. This isn't new information. You know, we know these things. But what tends to happen, especially when we're dealing with medical conditions or just, is that sometimes the more simple something is, the more it can get overlooked and we focus on you know, other more heroic measures. But it's really important. I mean, those heroic measures are wonderful, and thank goodness we have them, but we also want to focus in on those basics of day-to-day -day living. And one of those things is getting adequate hydration. Now, this can be pretty hard to do, right? Because we're not excited about the taste of water. <laughs> and, you know, especially living in the Pacific Northwest, you wouldn't know it this summer, but in general, we can get kind of waterlogged, you know, just because we live in a rainy climate. But getting enough hydration can really help. You know, a lot of times, um, even with the idea of fatigue, you know, or how someone feels, constipation, which can be a side effect, you know, that a lot of people are dealing with, getting enough hydration can really help. So what are ways that you've found that have worked for you to get more water in? Yes? Lemon. Lemon, great. Mio. What is it? Mio. What is Mio? It's a little container and it adds flavor. It's a zero calorie. I'm suspicious. I am. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a zero calorie thing in a container, I'm slightly suspicious. No. Okay, I checked your ingredients. Yeah. Jello. Jello. Jello, that's a way. And yeah, I'm just going to let that one slide. But, <laughs> talk about it, but there's, so, what are other ways? Fruit. Yes. Create a habit, and, and I've had to force myself to do it uh, first thing in the morning, before mm -hmm. anything else, I have a glass of water. Right. And at lunch, before anything else, I have a glass of water. Mm -hmm. and dinner, before anything else, and I've had to force myself to do it, but I finally have habitualized it. <laughs> Great. I love this. So he's creating a habit. You know, the, a rhythm that works for him. It's going to be different for everyone. But, you know, for him, he's created a rhythm where, okay, this is my time to drink. Yes? Um, every time taking meds, instead mm -hmm. of slips to get it down, make the whole glass. Right, with your meds, focusing on getting more. Yes? Um, foods that have a lot of water, like fruit or soup. <laughs> 
Right. And that can, that can be helpful depending on what's going on too. Like having it be more in, in foods. Ice. Ice, yes. Mm -hmm. Have a specific container that you just have to get through like three times a day. Yes, a specific container. And that can be really helpful because it creates a, a really clear visual goal. Like, okay, three times a day I need to refill this. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I'm driving. When you're driving, you drain your water. That's all. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like sitting outside in the car a lot. Okay, great. See, and what I love about that is it's individual. So when she's driving, that's when she's drinking. And also, it's creating a pattern of where she is. I know, we have to be careful with that, right? <laughs> now, other things, it, I mean, lemon is wonderful. You can also add things like rosemary. You know, you can cut up fruit. Cucumber, that's a great choice. Lemon. Lemon. Mint, that's a great one. Yes. You have to be careful with the lemon now. It'll erode the enamel off your teeth if you've got too much. <laughs> right, so we want to do everything in moderation, you know? Not get too. Uh... <laughs> so the goal with getting enough water is to aim to have clear urine. Now, I say that, but there's going to be exceptions. So if you're taking B vitamins, there's some medications that will discolor your urine. So if that isn't happening, you know, it could be something that else that you have that you're taking. But in general, that's a good sign. That's pretty individual. Okay, so now if we're, we're thinking about, in general, you know, what a plate would look like. And again, this is generalizing across the board. But we want to focus on about half of our plate as vegetables. Okay, so when we get vegetables in there, there's going to be a lot of vitamins, minerals, all these things. Now, how do we know there's vitamins and minerals in there? Colors. Color, exactly. So, it was mentioned with Dr. Brown in the, when he was first talking, you know that we want to have lots of color on our plate. And the more color we have, that's just an indicator of the more different vitamins and minerals that we are getting. Okay, but plus with that we get fiber, we get other things. But let's say there's one exception, because again, we have to keep this practical and realistic. You know, everybody has different levels of mobility, different things that they can do. So it would be lovely to sit down to a plate that had five different colors, you know, and get that rainbow in. However, if you're going to focus on one color, what would it be? Dark green. Dark green, right. We've got an educated group. Why dark green? It is higher in nutrients. So underneath that dark green color, you've got all those other colors, but the dark green is just so strong that it, that it covers it up. So for example, so it's called chlorophyll. That's that green pigment. So broccoli would be bright orange if it didn't have that green covering it. You know, so think about leaves, how they change colors in the fall. You know, from green to red to yellow, or wait, I skipped orange, but, you know, they go through that progression. So underneath that dark green color, you get this rainbow of colors. So if you're going to focus on one thing, dark greens. <laughs> now, they have to taste good. So how many people super love steamed broccoli with nothing on it? Okay, well, we've got some. Yay! <laughs> I would say, so I was, a, I was a personal chef for a while uh, before I went to graduate school in nutrition. And, you know, I'd go into a house that say, oh, no, my kids don't like vegetables. One of the first things I'd do would be roasted broccoli. You know, so we have to make the food taste good because we'll eat for a while with our mind. You know, because we think we should, because we think it's healthy. However, we want to make it taste good so we're inspired. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not because I have to, it's because, oh, this is really delicious. So finding preparations that you really enjoy, but that make it worthwhile for you. I also like the dark greens because they're, they're more robust. So you can make something, say, out of collards, or out of kale, or out of chard. Like, I like salads. Actually, everything, all the recipes that I put in my book, one of the criteria was that it needed to be able to last two weeks in the fridge <laughs> when it was vegetables. I mean, that's practical. I know if, I mean, I'm busy, but I'm also a nutritionist. So 
I mean, I have to walk my talk. If I come home and I'm tired and I don't have anything made, it's Pagliacci's here I come. <laughs> you know, we're human. We only have so much energy in the day. So the more you can make things in advance that you have in the fridge, that therefore then you can scoop out. You know, like, and not just the, those dark greens, but even like a raw beet salad. If you have a food processor, you know, you put it in, you know, you put olive oil, you know, apple cider vinegar, pumpkin seeds, parsley, apple, you know, make a salad like this, two weeks, no problem. And it actually tastes better as the days go on. So I would try to look for recipes like that so it maximizes on when you do have the energy to cook or to prepare something. Okay, so we want to just keep all of it practical. You know, planning menus, uh, making a shopping list. You know, cook when we have the most energy. I don't know why that got so big at the bottom. <laughs> Anything's on a Mac, so maybe it doesn't always translate. That didn't mean to have that kind of emphasis, <laughs> unless it means something for you, right? You know, but cooking ahead. So not, you know, not thinking about, okay, I've had a long day, now it's time to cook. Think about having things made in advance. You know, and it might be in the winter time, not so much now, but making a big pot of soup. It's kind of a, a one pot meal that you can just reheat through the week. You know, again, so sometimes we get caught up in this idea, like we think, okay, I'm going to have great nutrition. I'm really going to focus on it. And so then we think I'm going to make everything fresh. I'm going to cook it that day. It's going to be organic. It's all this stuff. And a lot of times that isn't practical. You know, we need to match where we are. And that means oftentimes making foods in advance. Maybe some things we can afford organic, some things we can't. That's fine. The goal is just get the vegetables in. You know, get the high quality food in in whatever way that works for you. So even, I love having frozen vegetables in the fridge or the freezer. You know, some things can. I mean, just think about what's going to be practical. We, we get in this all or nothing mentality, you know? It's all or nothing. It's organic, local, fresh, made from scratch, daily, or we're eating out or eating something out of the box. And let's try to think about also getting in the middle what's realistic for our, our family. And then you've got some ideas in terms of, you know, planning for a week. You know, thinking about what days do you need to cook foods that are easy to prepare? What days do you have more time to cook? You know, using that to your advantage. So in summary, just remember that we all have to eat. You know, it's something that we do every day. I mean, we're lucky in this country, that's, you know, we, we have adequate food, not everyone, but, but more so than a lot of places. So we all need to eat. So let's make this a powerful choice. You know, choosing the foods that really help with our health goals. But with that said, not 100%. We don't want to, we don't want to get too rigid. You know, if we start to do something 100%, it's, it can cross over into more of a, an issue. You know, if we focus on 80% of the time, focusing on whole foods, you know, and being really thoughtful with our diet, that's great. You know, 80% of the time. So it's not about 100%. Because that also helps, keep, helps us to stick with it. Because think about the times that we've done things 100%. What tends to happen? You fall off, right? You run out, exactly. We also talked about essential fatty acids. I actually didn't discuss breakfast, I must have skipped uh, over that slide, but in general, Grandma was right. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It starts us off to a, a good start. Our metabolism, actually I'll just briefly mention that because there's been, uh, you know, both speakers really talked about weight and how important uh, controlling weight is. Well, one of those things that's been found is when people have breakfast, then this helps to kickstart their metabolism and people tend to uh, weigh less overall. Now, there's some, there's some theories behind why this can happen, but how many of you have noticed that when you have breakfast, you feel more hungry than if you don't? Yeah, a lot of people. And this, So people will come in and they say, wait, I don't want to eat breakfast because if I eat breakfast, I'm more hungry throughout the day. So this is part of their weight loss strategy. But actually, there's a, there's a theory as to why that happens. 
So when we wake up in the morning, you know, we haven't eaten all night long, our body says, okay, food is going to come in. If food doesn't come in, then our body says, uh-oh, <clears throat> something's wrong. There's some, I mean, think about it through history. There's some type of scarcity. There's a famine. I mean, there's a food shortage of some type, so then metabolism slows down. We don't metabolize as efficiently. So eating breakfast can really help with kickstarting the metabolism. And then basically every three to four hours, you know, this can help as well. Now, it's going to be individual. Again, this is a big generalization. Maybe you're a breakfast, lunch, dinner person. Great. You know, listen to your body. Then we talked about hydration. And lastly, the big takeaway, hopefully, is to focus on whole foods. Foods that you know what they are. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your attention.